It's Sunday once again, brothers and sisters, and I'd like you to know that we are already having our in-person gathering without online registration. So for those of you who are in Cebu City, I'd like to invite you to join us in our worship gatherings at Banawa in our main church. And right now, for those of you who are outside of Cebu, I'd like to greet you and bless you a very great Sunday morning. I'd like to read to you Psalm 150, which says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, this psalm speaks about a kind of worship wherein the whole fiber of your being is involved. And after all, this is exactly what the Lord wants to happen. We are told in the scriptures, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that is true, you know, when we worship the Lord, as we express our love towards Him. We are to do with, with all our mind, soul, and with all our strength. We are told in the scriptures that he is seeking for worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. And today, we have the occasion, it is the Lord's day, to be able to do that. And I'd like to invite you now to please rise from your seats and let's worship together the name of the Lord. Your name. 
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. Great news, brothers and sisters. We will resume our weekend and person services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. Register now at www.livingword.ph forward slash in dash person dash service. Good news, brothers and sisters, Enough is Enough is making a comeback in our church right now. And we are selling it again at 275 pesos here in our church. And you can get a copy right now and share it among your friends. International Bible Institute would like to make an announcement. IBI is still accepting enrollees for the following online courses. OT101, The Pentateuch. OT102, Early Israelite History. PE304, Personal Evangelism. CH305, Church History. HOM306, Sermon Preparation and Delivery. For more inquiries, you may contact 0917-771-6297 or 0922-864-7222 or email us at ibi.livingwordcm at yahoo.com or visit us at Facebook, International Bible Institute, Cebu Extension. Great news! IBI has a new charter in Palawan. You may get in touch with the IBI Palawan Charter at this address. 256 Abad Santos Extension, Bancao Bancao, Puerto Princesa City, Palawan. Or you may call 0920-853-7116 or 0909-300-8863 for more information. We have great news! We are happy to announce that we now have our very own Living Word Online Bookstore. Your favorite Living Word discipleship materials are now available for download straight to your devices. For a very minimal fee of 100 pesos only, you can now avail of the electronic copies in PDF format. Our Ephesians Volume 1 and Volume 2 are ready for your download. The Journey series, Knowing Christ, is now available online as well. And likewise, we have free study materials like More Than Enough Study Guide, Enough is Enough Study Guide. To avail and for more details, please visit books.com livingword.ph Stay tuned as we make more of our discipleship materials available on our online bookstore. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000060800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234814. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. 
To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 001-0000060800, and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless. The title of this sermon is The Eyes That Do Not See. We will take our text from Matthew 9, verses 32 to 34. As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. At this time, let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for this wonderful Sunday morning. And we come before you, O God, asking that your grace be upon us so that we could understand your word. I pray for myself, O God, that you might anoint and empower me. I pray, Father, that your wisdom will just uh, somehow be my guide. And I pray, Father, that I might be able to express that. I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, when we examine this passage uh, it becomes clear in our observation, not only in this passage, but in other passages as well, that the ministry and even the person of Jesus Christ always had a mixed reaction in the crowd. We would like, uh, we would like obviously, for people to accept Jesus, to love Jesus, worship Jesus. That is what you and I want and we desire that that people might might accept Jesus for who he really is. But the sad thing, as you and I very well know, is that there's always a mixed reaction when it comes to the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. At other times, you will find belief, but at other times, you will find unbelief. There will be times of joy, but there will also be times of anger towards the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be times when Jesus would be accepted, but there will also be times when our Lord Jesus would be rejected. This is the entire spectrum of how people respond to Jesus Christ. Some of them negative, some of them positive. And by the way, if you really think about it, all the things that Jesus did were always the right things to do. And not only that, he did it in an unquestionable and powerful way. And yet, if we look at the response, majority of people actually even reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why for us who happen to be heralds, and we all believers of the Lord Jesus Christ happen to be heralds, we heralds oftentimes would be rejected as well. And that is why what is important is faithfulness in the work of the Lord. Regardless of the reaction, let us do what we need to do. But anyway, 
we don't want to go into other sidebars uh, at the start. And so let me just share to you the three points of our study today. In verses 32 to 33a, we find the petition and the power of Jesus. And in verse 33b, the crowd's amazement. And in verse 34, the Pharisees' rejection. So let's dive into our study and let's talk about the petition and power of Jesus beginning at verse 32. It says, As they were going out, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him or brought to Jesus. Now, because of the news that was spreading, about Jesus uh, being a miracle worker, obviously word about the resurrection of the daughter of uh, Jairus uh, had been heard by a multitude of people. They heard about this hemorrhaging woman who had been sick for 12 years and she got instantly healed. And, and just before this incident, there were two blind men whose eyesight was restored and so they these people heard miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle and because of this uh, there was a deluge of petitions heading towards the Lord Jesus Christ people were gravitating towards him and I think if if this happened in our day and time, we would have the same response because there are a lot of people who have a great need. Some people are sick of a, a terminal sickness. We still have people who are lame. We still have people who are blind and people who have incurable sicknesses. And so if and when you hear about a great and mighty miracle worker, obviously, it will produce a deluge of petitions. And that is why in this particular case, we find another petition which required a supernatural intervention. And what we find here is that in spite of the fact that there was a deluge of petitions and it must have been wearing down physically on the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was tireless. He was in perpetual motion. He was in constant motion all the time. And to what do we attribute this? We attribute this to the servant heart of Jesus Christ. All along in the book of Matthew, I have been presenting to you evidences that Matthew has given to us that Jesus indeed is the promised Davidic King, Messiah, and Savior of the world. And that is what Matthew had been able to do, and he was able to present it in a succinct way. And yet, while you and I are probably convinced that Jesus is the Davidic king, he was a different kind of king. He was a servant king. And one of the passages that truly inspires me is that passage during uh, his post-resurrection appearance, wherein he was back uh, near the Sea of Galilee and his disciples saw him from afar and, and Peter dove into the water, he swam ashore and the rest of the disciples followed suit. And when they came to the shore, Jesus had prepared breakfast for them. I mean, Jesus could have treated treated his disciples like minions who would serve him. And yet time and time again, Jesus proved himself a different kind of king. He was a servant king. And of course, the other thing that comes to my mind is how Jesus wrapped a towel um, on himself and started to wash the dirty feet of the disciples. Such a demonstration of leadership, a different kind of leadership tells us that the kind of leader that God wants uh, for us to have is a servant kind of leader. After all, the Lord Jesus Christ said, he who wants to be greatest of all must be servant of all. And as I mentioned to you, Jesus must have been tired with all the petitions and all the cries for deliverance and Jesus was ministering to, to hundreds of people every single day. 
and yet he was still willing to minister to people and what an inspiration this is to me and i i see this um in the case of some people um one of the people that had inspired me as well is dr grant osborne who just recently passed away about a couple of years ago and we had this great theologian this great scholar uh, to minister to us quite a number of times. In fact, I think he ministered to us about three times. And the last time he was here, he had to crawl, literally crawl up the stairs because he had such very weak legs that, you know, his legs could not, could not uh, propel itself from one step to another. And so he would use his hands to, to climb up. And it was really a sorry sight that this man had to crawl up the stairs. But he did that without any complaining. And he had so much energy that he preached for, I think, three days. And in those three days, he hardly took a break. I mean, he was like a, a walking encyclopedia, just rattling things off his brain and i don't think he even had notes uh, with him if he had notes i think it was just a basic outline and you know what a great inspiration he somehow follows the lead of the lord jesus christ and another man that inspires me is dr harold sela who is well into his 80s and before the pandemic hit, he was traveling all over the world, serving God with much gusto. And every time I would have uh, a, a, a quiet time with him over lunch or over dinner, you know, he never stopped ministering. He, he, would, he would tell me stories. He would tell me principles and precepts that he had learned. And, you know, he was just pouring himself out to me. And that is, that is who Jesus was. He was constantly pouring himself into the lives of other people. And so what a great inspiration this is. Now, in this particular case, we find a mute, demon-possessed man who, who was brought to him, maybe by his relatives or maybe by his friends. And so this person had two conditions. He was mute and he was demon-possessed at the same time. And we are told in verse 33 that after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. Now, let me just give you one medical explanation or a few medical explanations why people become mute or they are unable to speak. And I'm talking from the medical side of it, first of all. Well, accidents and disease cause could cause a loss of hearing and foreign matter could collect in the earwax and become breeding ground for infectious organisms that eventually destroys hearing. While others could have congenital deafness, unable to hear at a very young age, they would be unable to speak. But again, in this particular case, we're not talking about a medical condition of deafness, or I'm sorry, muteness. We're not talking about a case that is congenital. But the reason why this person was mute was because he was demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, there was deliverance, and this man was able to speak. And from here, we can actually glean a lesson you know i've been in conversation with some people and it seems like there are some people who believe that there is no such thing as the supernatural they do not believe for example in the presence of angels they do not believe in the presence of demons and they will always say that there's always a natural scientific medical explanation for things but i'm here to tell you dear brothers and sisters that sometimes 
there are certain things that cannot be explained from the material world. There is no medical, scientific explanation. And sometimes there are certain conditions that are brought about by a demonic presence. And I've heard so many stories and testimonies of such things taking place. And that is why we find here that, that the demons are, are out there to make our lives miserable, to bring about suffering and oppression. And this had happened in the case of this mute person. I mean, can you imagine this person wanted to express himself, wanted to, to speak out, and yet he could not. And it's possible based on this story that there was a time in his life wherein he could actually speak. But now, because of the presence of this demon, he could no longer communicate, he could no longer express himself. And what an agony, what, what difficulty this must have been on the part of this mute person. And again, that tells you, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Of course, the primary context of that has to do with false shepherds, but we know the real false shepherd is none other than Satan himself. He is the inventor of all these false religions, and he wants to make our lives miserable, and that is exactly what happened here. I recall the story of one sister of ours who had an x-ray uh, done on her back because she was suffering, she was agonizing with severe uh, back pains. And from the x-ray that was seen, um, it somehow showed that there was something terribly wrong with her spine and that she needed an operation. At that time, there was no surgeon who could do that here in Cebu. And so it was recommended for her to go to Manila to have her own surgery. And, and so she, she made an appointment with the doctor in Manila so that she could have her surgery. But the doctor uh, wanted to be thorough about it. And so another x-ray was made. And to her surprise, in the x-ray that was, that was made, there was absolutely nothing wrong with the spine. And guess what? The pain was also gone. Well, what is the medical explanation to that? Well, there is no medical explanation because that spinal problem could not be solved by uh, natural means. Um, it could not be solved. It could only be solved, medically speaking, through a surgery. But the fact that there was no surgery that was performed meant, and this was her conclusion, her conclusion was this was a demonic attack. This was a demonic oppression. And when the demon left her, then there was no longer any pain and no longer any problem with her back. And so, again, God is still able to do those miracles in our day and in our time. God could still cast out demons. Um, there was a conversation uh, between two friends, and uh, one of the friends said that um, uh, this person no longer believes in, in demons being cast out. Well, you know, if you go to Africa, there's still a lot of witchcraft going on. Go to China, there's a lot of witchcraft that is still going on. In other words, there is a lot of demonic activity that is still going on in the world today. In fact, when you go to the United Kingdom, there are a lot of people who are into occultism and a lot of people who are into witchcraft. And so people who are involved in these things there is some level of demonization that is taking place. And, and if, if you are saying that we can no longer cast out demons today, what will happen to these people who are demonized and want to be delivered? Then there's no longer to, going to be any hope whatsoever for them. So I'm here to tell you that the coming, and, and this is something I'm, I'm going a little uh, sideways here, but you have to understand, and this is what George Eldon Ladd said, by the way, 
the coming of the kingdom meant also that demons would be cast out. And so if we're saying that there's no longer any casting out of demons, are we saying the kingdom of God is no longer present in our midst? And you and I know that the kingdom of God has broken into this world with the coming of Jesus Christ. And I, I know that the kingdom of God will still have its ultimate and final manifestation. But having said that, the kingdom of God has broken into our world. And therefore, there is still authority on our part to cast out demons. After all, as John the Beloved says, Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. And we are the sent ones of God. God has sent us to do his work. Remember what Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So I felt that that's a very important uh, side note because, again, we might think that this is no longer happening. It is still happening in our day and time. People are still being demonized. In fact, in my 37 years of ministry, there have been occasions wherein I have personally seen some people demonized. And there was one particular occasion when I was involved in the casting out of demons um, with a particular uh, person and there was deliverance. And so again, we have to take note of this. Satan is still in the business of making things miserable for us. Now, having said that, we are not to overemphasize the activity of demons to think that there's a demon everywhere. All right. There's a demon in the doorknob. There's a demon on the wall. Uh, there's a demon on my table. Some people can overemphasize the ministry or rather the activity of demons. And when you do that, you're actually glorifying the work of demons. So don't do that, dear brothers and sisters. But having said that, you have authority over them. Now, let's find out the crowd's amazement in verse 33b. It says, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Now, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ had spanned for several months already. It was not even a year of ministry. But in less than a year's ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ had already produced a magnitude, an absolute unique magnitude of miracles. And here was a display of divine power unequaled, not only in the history of Israel, but in the history of the world. And again, just like what um, John the Beloved said in the Gospel of John, he said that, if all the works of Jesus Christ were written, uh, written down, all the books in the world will not be able to contain it. Of course, he was using hyperbole basically to mean that Jesus performed hundreds, maybe even thousands of miracles. And so Jesus was able to produce all of these things. And by the way, he had a 100% batting average when it came to healing, when it came to performing miracles. The only time he did not perform a miracle was in Nazareth because of the unbelief of um, his, his, hometown, his hometown people. They did not believe that he could perform miracles. But again, Jesus performed miracle upon miracle north, south, east, and west of Israel. And by the way, the miracles that Jesus performed were greater than Moses, Elijah, and Elisha combined. And, and the casting out of demons, by the way, was, was a powerful, stupendous miracle because there were already Jewish exorcists at that time. But as I mentioned to you in a previous sermon, they did not have much success. Many of the people that they were trying to cast out demons from remained demonized. But Jesus... Jesus performed uh, casting out of demons, and, and demons were even afraid of him. 
And that is why people were amazed that Jesus could not only heal, perform miracles, resurrect people from the dead, but he could even cast out demons. Now, when you examine the Old Testament, there was only one particular record of somebody casting out demons, and it happened in the person of David in the Old Testament. And I just like to quote to you 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. It says, So it came about, whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. And so, again, there, there's very scant detail regarding uh, exorcism, and only Jesus was, was successful in doing that. Matthew 9, 33, by the way, indicates that the crowds were greatly amazed not only with his miracles, but most especially with his exorcism. Now, with all that Christ had done, this should have been enough to convince everybody that this is the promised Messiah. A new era of unsurpassed miracles was clear proof that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. And so we would hope, we would, we would, we would like to think that with all that people have seen, all that people have heard, and, and people have seen this with, with their own eyes, we would expect that people would be convinced. We would expect that people would prostrate themselves and bow down themselves before the Lord and, and recognize that He indeed is the Messiah. That is what we would expect. Now, there were some, obviously, in the crowd who believed Jesus for who He really was, that He was the Son of David, that He was the Son of God, that He was the Messiah. Well, let me tell you this. We see that we see um, that there are still some people who eventually um, no longer follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We see in the middle and near the end of the book of Matthew that only a remnant of people remain as genuine believers. And John the Beloved was correct when he said in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. You see, there are some people who follow Jesus because of the benefits that they could get. And this was very true in the ministry of Jesus. There were some people who were following Jesus because they were hungry. Or because they were thirsty. They were following Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was performing miracles or maybe healed them of their diseases. Maybe the Lord uh, had been in, in the wedding, for example, of Cana when he turned the water into wine. And, and Jesus, Jesus did all of these things, obviously, out of compassion, out of mercy. And yet people were there not because they wanted Jesus, but because they wanted the benefits that Jesus could give to them. And sadly, there are still some people like that today. They run to Jesus. Why? Because they're desperate. They run to Jesus because they need healing. They run to Jesus because they need money. They run to Jesus because they have a problem. They run to Jesus. Why? Because you know they're unemployed and they, they want a job or maybe there's something they're, they're searching for or looking for or wanting. And so they, they draw near to Jesus. But when God has answered their prayers, when Jesus has delivered them from their problems, they turn their backs on Jesus Christ. There were a lot of people like that. That is why the, multitudes, uh, the multitude that was crying out to Jesus, Hosanna, to the son of David, they were also the same ones who later on said, crucify him. What a sad story. Which... By the way, this, this passage that we're studying ends in a sad note, the Pharisees' rejection of Jesus in verse 34. It says, But the Pharisees were saying, 
he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Now, one thing we note here is that the Pharisees did not believe Jesus. You know, the sad part with the Pharisees, as we observe, is that they believed their oral traditions. They believed uh, their, their interpretations of the Old Testament rather than believing the words of Jesus Christ. And not only that, because they could not deny the miracles of Jesus because they were happening right before their very eyes. It was done in public. It was provable. It was numerous. And so since they could not disprove that there was indeed a miracle that had taken place, they now denied the source of these miracles. Now, you and I know who the source of the miracles were. The source of the miracles happened to be God. But because they could not deny the miracles of Jesus Christ, and because they rejected the person of Jesus Christ, they denied the source. And they said, it's not coming from God, it's coming from demons. And what a horrid blasphemy this was. The word saying, by the way, is in the Greek imperfect, which means that this was not a one-time statement, but something that they had been continually saying all along. Maybe all throughout the three-year ministry of Jesus Christ, every time the Lord Jesus performed a miracle, they would say, oh, it's not coming from God. This man is not from God. They would say, this miracle is from demons. Jesus is in league with demons. And that's really the sad part here. They, they did not open their eyes. They did not open their minds. They did not open their hearts to the truth that Jesus was presenting. And that is what is so sad here. The religious leaders rejected him and, and even accused him of being in league with Satan himself. And what is sad, you know, is that in the future, Israel will receive not the true Messiah, but a false Messiah. Jesus, in fact, had prophesied that a time would come when Israel would receive a false Messiah, somebody who would present himself as the promised Davidic King, Messiah, and Savior of the world, and he would present himself to them in a future time, and Israel would receive him and accept him. Sadly, Israel had missed the day of their visitation, but of course, there is still hope because Today, there are some of those who are called Messianic Jews who believe in Jesus, but they are a very small percentage in Israel. And uh, the Lord is, is speaking of a day and a time when Israel would suffer, but during the time of the tribulation period, there will be a lot of, of Jews who would accept Jesus finally after they go through difficult times in the tribulation period. But anyway, let me just share to you that verse which tells about uh, this particular uh, event in history. In John chapter 5, verse 43, it says, I have come, this is Jesus speaking, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, referring to the Antichrist, you will receive him. Now, that is so sad. They missed the day of their visitation. The Pharisees, you know, rejected Christ because they believed more in themselves. They believed more in their oral traditions. They believed more in their interpretations of Scripture. And, you know, when, when a person, when an unbeliever has determined in his heart not to believe truth, there's nothing, no, there's nothing you can do. You can only present the truth, and if they reject it, then there's nothing else you can do. And my advice to people uh, uh, who are sharing the gospel, and yet you're sharing to the same people over and over again, and yet they continue to reject it, they continue to harden their hearts, they continue to be stubborn, they continue to, to insult, your faith the bible tells us 
that a time needs to, to come when we stop sharing the gospel to them. And I'd like to quote to you Matthew chapter 7, verse 6 here. It says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The Bible says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, do not give pearls to swine. And again, uh, this is what we need to do when we are constantly rejected. But I guess for some people, this is not your problem. Your problem is not rejection. Your problem is you're not sharing the gospel. And so for people who are not sharing the gospel, you need to go out. You need to share the gospel. You need to preach the word of God to other people. Speak the truth in love. That is what you need to do. And if people constantly reject you, well, then that's the time to stop. So in the previous sermon that we had uh, last time around, what did we see? We saw two blind men who were able to see the truth. And why were they able to see the truth? Because they had heard scripture and they saw what Jesus did and they put one and one together and it aligned, it aligned with each other and they agreed with scripture they agreed with what jesus was doing and they came to the conclusion that jesus indeed is the promised davidic king messiah and savior of the world that is why even though they were blind they called jesus the son of david something which people did not see other people did not see particularly the pharisees in this case they failed to see jesus for who he really was and what we can say about the pharisees was that they were the ones who were really blind they were spiritually blind and leading other blind people friends let us not be blind to the truth of the person of jesus christ if you have not yet received christ as lord and savior of your life i'm here to tell you all the claims of Jesus are true, and all his promises are true. When he says that he shall give you eternal life, if you believe him, if you trust in him, then he will do that. And remember this, a person is not saved by his good works because what God requires is perfection, and we are not perfect. But Jesus performed the perfect sacrifice in Calvary, and through his sacrifice, we can be made righteous, not our own righteousness, but his righteousness can be imputed to us for as long as we trust him and surrender our lives to him. And that is my prayer for you. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for this time. And we pray that the word will truly make its impact in the lives of of the people who are listening to me right now whatever has been achieved today we give you back the glory praises and thanks in jesus blessed name we pray amen amen god bless you brothers and sisters we'll see you once again next weekend here are our announcements we now have two kinds of services we will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. We will resume our weekend and person services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. Register now at www dot living word dot ph forward slash in dash person dash service 
We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068-00. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 001-0000060800, and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give. And then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.